That's actually the hard thing. So, everybody follow the rules well enough that I don't think I need to do that again. Please don't make me. Our first speaker today is George Andrews. He'll be speaking on false data functions, mock data functions, and orthogonal polynomials. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I had a chance last evening to um, say a few things about Goron. Uh, I do want to add one thing that I did not mention last night, that sort of forms the theme for this talk. Then he's also someone who looks after the, uh, the more downtrodden, the less advantaged the people or in institutions that are not, uh, so to speak, in favor. And so that is a noble quality. And to honor that, I'm going to talk about, focus my talk on uh, the something listed in this last letter that Ramanujan wrote to G.H. Hardy in 1920. So this is where he introduced the mock theta functions that have so recently become such a hot topic in the intersection of uh, Q-series and modular forms. Ramanujan says, I'm extremely sorry for not writing you a single letter up to now. I discovered very <coughs> interesting functions recently which I call mock theta functions. Unlike the false state functions studied partially by Professor Rogers in his interesting paper, they enter into mathematics as beautifully as the ordinary theta functions. So this is, so to speak, the, the real introduction of false theta functions to the world. What a horrible name. Uh, so it is no wonder with, uh, with public relations aspects like this that they have fallen somewhat into disuse. And so I want to uh, at least, well, show that Ramanujan didn't actually mean this, and also to talk about uh, some of the, uh, of the applications of these. So what is a false theta function exactly? It's defined inside the unit circle by a series whose terms in absolute value are those of a classical theta series, but the signs are wrong. So one of the most famous theta series is Gauss's triangular number series that you see uh, listed here. But there's a companion false theta series, which is Gauss's series, except that it has the signs alternate. It is possible, of course, to change Q into minus Q in the top line. But in that case, then, you get a, a pair of minus signs, a pair of plus signs. There's no way by a change of variable to change the top line into the bottom line. And this is called what Rogers called the false theta function, but buried that name in one of the papers that nobody read until Ramanujan came along and popularized them. A further example of the false Theta series is Euler's famous pentagonal number theorem, which is listed uh, in the top line here. And a, compan a companion false theta series is this same series with alternating signs. To be fair to Ramanujan, in his lost notebook, he gives a number of formulas for the uh, false theta series. So let me put on the screen five series that appear in this same order in a, uh, on one page of Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. So you can see that these don't change all that much from line to line. You have to sort of look carefully to see what the difference is. Each line is different from the others. Uh, the, uh, the top line, for example, uh, the exponents are the doubles of the triangular numbers. In, in the other lines, the exponents of Q are just the nat natural numbers themselves. Uh, and then there are these standard finite products that we are reasonably familiar with. The interesting thing, though, is that what Ramanujan found is that the first series is, in fact, 
this false theta series that I showed you just now. The second ser series is the same false theta series with Q replaced by Q squared. The third one is Q replaced by Q cubed. The fourth one is Q replaced by Q to the fourth. And for $100, what's the next one? <laughs> 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 and so the point of that exercise was to reveal that Ramanujan was not so uh, contentious of the false theta series, even though he, uh, he, he said what he said about them. I guess the reason he said that probably is because he was so excited about the Mach theta functions. And I will say something about the Mach theta functions as the talk goes on. But I want to start out with uh, something uh, explicitly related to an application of them. So I'm going to move now to something that is part of theoretical physics. So in the mid-80s, there were a spate of papers in physics journals about SSAW, spiral self-avoiding walks. So let me explain what spiral self-avoiding walks are. So you start at the origin and you proceed to the integer points in the plane of the following rules. You start out going up the y-axis. You may go up the y-axis as far as you like, but your rule always is that you either go straight ahead or turn right. And so if you want to have spiral self-avoiding wonks with five segments in them, these are the 13 that are possible. Of these, there are seven, and I have circled them here. That are could be continued indefinitely, assuming the next segment is a right turn. So some of these, the uncircled ones, if you turn right at the end of the walk, you are not going to be able to go on indefinitely but with the seven circle ones. So these are called CSSAWs, concatenatable spiral self avoiding walks. And the thing that the physicists noticed was that they were able to do the asymptotics for the number of CSSAWs, and it turned out that the asymptotics were the same as the ordinary partition function. And then somebody noticed that not only were the asymptotics the same, this was the ordinary <laughs> partition function. And uh, so, as most everybody in the audience will know, there are seven partitions of five. So in some way or other, these CSSAWs can be mapped on to, uh, to ordinary partitions. And this was done by Michael Hirshhorn and Tony Goodman. Uh, this is, I'm going to do it in my own language, but it is basically their, their observation. So the thing to start out with is what's called the Frobenius symbol of the partition. So here you see a partition and the standard Ferrer's graph listed below it. And the way a Frobenius symbol is produced is to blot out the diagonal in the Ferrer's graph and then read the rows to the right and the columns below the diagonal. It may well be that there will be no uh, uh, last row. And if you look at this for a while, you will see that a Frobenius symbol consists of Scared me, I thought it was mine. <laughs> the Frobenius symbol consists of a two e equal length rows of decreasing non negative integers. So you can't have a zero as the last entry in a row. And that there is, via this means, a perfect one to one correspondence between the Frobenius symbol and ordinary partitions. And indeed, here is how you produce 
the the 